And just to open us up a little bit, um, so uh, of course, deep beneath the Chihuahuan Desert in southern New Mexico uh, is a labyrinth of more than 300 limestone caves carved over 250 million years ago, Carlsbad Caverns National Park. The park also preserves biologically diverse desert lands above ground, as well as a portion of an exposed fossil reef. One of the most notable sites at Carlsbad Caverns is the park's 400,000 Brazilian free-tailed bats and other species of bats leaving the cave each night at sunset. The landscape around Carlsbad Caverns National Park, which just last week celebrated its 100th anniversary, is characterized by unique and fragile cave and karst systems, which extend far beyond the park's boundaries. The park is also an economic driver, bringing a cumulative benefit of $27.4 million to the local economy in 2021. But unbalanced development in the area, including a huge uptick in oil and gas activity in recent years, can pose a threat to cave ecosystems, water supplies, and public health. So we're so excited to share uh, some of this incredible geology with you tonight, uh, and a couple of us share ways that you can stay involved with efforts to protect and be engaged in the area. So our agenda for tonight, uh, we'll start with introductions of the four of us that you see to the world of the cave and karst landscape. Uh, we'll see a beautiful short video by Dr. Dave Decker uh, about some of these caves in the extended landscape. And then you'll be free to answer or ask a few questions um, towards the end of the webinar. Uh, we'll have questions to be answered into the chat, which will come through to our uh, us as panelists. Um, and then we'll go into some ways that you can stay in touch and stay involved. So I'll kick things off very quickly with a couple of introductions of myself and then uh, Kaylee, who's here as well. Um, so my name is Emily Wolf. Um, I'm the New Mexico Program Manager for the National Parks Conservation Association. Uh, so we are an independent nonpartisan membership organization devoted to advocacy of the national park system. Our mission is to protect and enhance America's national parks for present and future generations. And Kaylee, I'll hand it to you. Hello, folks. My name is Kaylee Shoup. I'm a community organizer with a very small grassroots environmental advocacy group called Citizens Caring for the Future. We're based in Carlsbad, and we work to make sure that our air, water, land, and public health stay protected during this current oil and gas boom. And um, to my knowledge, we are the only group of our kind in the entirety of the Permian Basin. So just a little bit of larger context there. And then I'll pass it back to you, Emily. I wasn't sure. Great, thank you, Kaylee. Um, yeah, and I'll go ahead and introduce uh, our speakers and uh, uh, panelists this evening. Uh, Patricia Sizer is the National Cave and Karst Program Coordinator with the Park Service and the Director of Cave and Karst Management Science uh, for the National Cave and Karst Research Institute. And Dave Decker is the CEO and Principal Geologist for Southwest Geophysical Consulting. So we're just thrilled to have you both here with us. and. Um, as we kick things off, I will hand it over to Pat. Good evening. So I have a long association with Carlsbad, partly because of exploration um, there as a caver to map caves. Um, and it's, if you like small dark places or big dark places, this is, as far as I'm concerned, the place to be. <laughs> the, this region is amazing. We're gonna start off first with a couple of definitions. So the next slide, we'll talk about what karst is. And um, this, this is out on the Permian Basin on, at Burton Flats, actually. Um, this is a really good example of, of um, the, the landscape that karst often looks, looks like. There are stream passages, both on the left and right side. Um, these are ephemeral springs, um, the streams, they only essentially flow when we have the monsoon, monsoon season, um, but they all go down to small sinks, and in this case, on the right-hand side of this uh, the screen is a um, cave entrance. So Karst is made of soluble rocks, limestone, 
um, the evaporites, gypsum, and um, uh, <laughs> sorry, just lost the word, and hydrite, and hand, and I can't say it, and hydrites. Um, so there's dis disappearing streams and sinkholes I mentioned, and then there are underground conduits, uh, and they're as large, they can be very small, that water flows through, or they can be much larger, and we call those caves. The next slide, we'll talk a little bit about what caves are. They're naturally occurring voids. This is critical. Um, we can't, we don't want to call anything man-made, whether it's a tunnel or um, a a, drill, a water hole or anything like that. It has to be naturally occurring and it has to be large enough for a person to enter. Um, all caves have three zones in terms of lighting. There's an entrance zone, uh, there's a twilight zone, and then there's a dark zone, which is permanent. There, You need a light to, to actually see no matter what time of day or night it is. So let's move on now into the geology of the area. Uh, you can see Carlsbad in this slide is in the upper middle portion. Um, north and northwest of Carlsbad is what is known as the Northwest Shelf. And we'll talk a little bit further about that in a moment. Um, on the lower end of the screen, we talk about the reef margin. And then out on the uh, right-hand side of the screen is the Delaware Basin. And this is uh, extremely important to understand how this works uh, because it's ecologically an incredible area, um, and it's not often in the U.S. that we see um, all three types of caves, limestone, gypsum, and evaporitic caves come together at the same spot. So here's a picture if you were standing out down in Texas looking back towards Carlsbad, um, you would see these formations. Um, assuming you could cut through the earth. So in the middle, the orange part is known as the Western Shelf area. The blue in front of that to the right of it is where the Capitan limestone is, where we see things like Carlsbad Caverns, Lechaguilla Cave, um, many of the Guadalupe um, caves up in the Lincoln National Forest. And then to the uh, right is the portion that is known as the Permian Basin. So this is kind of, um, I like to sort of joke that certain parts of Carlsbad can be considered formally known as reef oceanside uh, property. Um, I don't recommend using that to sell your land. People, unless they're geologists, might not understand what you're talking about. But this is a better picture, I think, for most people if, that are not geologists to understand that we used to have a shallow ocean out here. Um, there was a reef, and if you look on the lower portion, those are what made the reef, not our modern day corals. Um, and so that has its own impact on how a reef functions, how it ch um, changes the, um, becomes uh, limestone eventually. And um, some of the fossils, many of the fossils we'll see within that limestone. Uh, to the backside is what we call the, the, the reef has both a fore reef, which is where all the, the dead um, animals started falling down and any debris and rubble that might have been coming offshore down into the, into the ocean itself. And then there's the back reef, which is often smaller rocks and stuff that have been worn down um, and rounded. They're, they're pretty cool looking when we find those. It out on out in the um, the rocks when we're we're hiking uh, anything around Carlsbad caverns and um, some of the other areas there have some phenomenal things there if you know what you're looking for and then there's the basin off to the right and that was the ocean um, obviously it filled up eventually as climate changed. Um, and we had a lot of the evaporitics, the gypsum, the anhydrites and stuff that um, developed there. And there's in some places as much as 3000 feet of, of those types of rocks in the formation. So in the next slide, so one of the things that this area is really incredibly known for is we used to think there was only one type of cave, way caves were formed. 
And this is the classic. Um, water came from outside, came down onto the landscape and began sinking into the limestone, uh, eating, it became slightly carbonic um, acid in it, um, helping dissolve some of the rock, starting through cracks eventually over time as it got bigger, the, the cracks would you get with laminar flow plus mechanical breaking down of the rocks. And so these passages got bigger and deeper um, and became eventually quite complex if the limestone is deep enough. Um, many of the caves back east, such as you know Mammoth Cave is a classic one that fits this description. And this is what was known for thought to be the way caves were formed, probably, thinking it's the 1880s, 1890s. And then in the 70s, um, people started looking at the Carlsbad area and thinking maybe there's a whole different way these caves are formed because they don't meet some of the picture, they don't match some of the things that we normally see back east. So the next slide talks about hypogenic speleogenesis. And this is where water, instead of coming from above actually comes in from below. These caves are made from the bottom up. And in this area, um, specifically, we have sulfur, uh, hydrosulfide coming up. And these are coming very, very deep from um, oil and gas reserves that are being released and coming up through the rocks and up into the, into the limestone area. They engage with the groundwater there. It becomes hydro, hydro sulfuric acid um, and starts eating away the rock. One of the ways that you can see this um, work is that it, instead of carrying top, forming these pits and stuff that go down into the ground, they start eating away and swirling around and pushing its way through any type of um, spot that's weak. It pushes, it likes to push up. And so we get these cupolas or what we call dome pits. Um, in the former one, a, a dome, if you climbed up into it, you knew there was passage above because passage started from above. Now we get these cupolas that are essentially blind leads. They don't go anywhere. And that's because it was being eaten from, the rock was being dissolved from the bottom up. So we have both of these um, ways of developing the caves in the Carlsbad area. And that, that's pretty spectacular, geologically speaking. So, so one of the things we always think about first is these super cool formations. That's what everybody wants to see. We all go to Carlsbad and to any of the other caves that are out in the landscape there to see these amazing formations. But these aren't why the caves exist. The caves are created, whether it's from water coming from the top down or from the water coming from the bottom up. They're hollowed out, the landscape is hollowed out and then these formations occur afterwards. This is when water does indeed come from the surface, comes down, dissolves more of the rock, picks up some of the other minerals in the area and starts coming into these hollow spaces and evaporizing, uh, evaporating and leaving behind these various minerals. Um, what's amazing is just the, the, the differentiation and the types of formations. Um, that in and of itself explaining how these formations occurred, why they occur the way they do, is a, a special science within, within speleology. But in terms of cave formation, they're secondary deposits. They're not what occurred primarily when the caves were first formed. So we're gonna talk a little bit just about some of the limestone caves. Um, the gypsum uh, that you picture that you see on the bottom right is um, occurs from the hydrogen sulfide coming up into the rock, dissolving it away, and starting to dissolve the limestone, but it doesn't completely dissolve at all. And it converts the limestone into gypsum. Carlsbad Caverns, several other caves in the area have these massive beds of gypsum that are explained within the cave that are explained because of this hydrogen sulfide process. Um, there are many other things. Many of the caves are close to the surface, uh, particularly caves such as um, that are out on Burton Flats and in, in the Permian Basin area. 
um, and you can see roots coming in. That's what you see in the, the upper right hand picture is roots from the surface. So we know that our plants and stuff are coming in. They're looking for moisture um, from that is not there on the surface. And um, so they, that's something that we don't typically think about as a geologist. And then you start realizing that geology and biology are connected. Um, so we're gonna look at, so we have numerous limestone caves, as I mentioned, Carlsbad Caverns, um, their caves are all in limestone. The Most of the caves on the forest service are limestones. Um, and then we get out onto the flats and we get uh, different types. We get the evaporitic caves. So gypsum is a, a type of evaporite. This is really interesting because these caves are formed very close to the surface. Uh, and in some cases, they, you can see them dissolving up and uh, shortly um, they will make break through to the surface. These also have, these have, these are kind of fun to look at. The background of this picture is very scalloped. That shows water moving through the cave. It's a very soft rock. It doesn't need any type of sulfuric acid or carbonic acid. Just regular clean rainwater will dissolve this rock away. And you can get it flows. These passages will, um, can flood. It's, it's a very serious thing to understand that in, during the monsoon season that we need to be well aware of how fast and how rapidly these can flood. It can rain up in the Guadalupe Mountains and suddenly flood down in the Karst Plain here. And then one of the other things that people often forget, as I mentioned earlier, as geologists, we forget how important um, our geology is for wildlife. You see some pictures here of crickets. They're amazing little critters. Some stay their entire life in caves. Others use the caves as shelter, cooling, moisture area. They come out at night when it cools down to feed on whatever um, is out there that they might want. Rattlesnakes are awesome. A lot of people don't like them, but um, they make use of caves as shelters. And, um, and then we have our bats. Bats are amazing. Some of them, Carlsbad, it was mentioned earlier, has 400,000 bats in their caves of various species. Uh, we get small um, colonies, usually maternity colonies um, or bachelor colonies in many of our caves throughout the Carlsbad region. In some places, the bats are just transitory. They're meandering around. They may have been caught out in a rainstorm, went into the cave for for the night for shelter and then um or I mean during the day in the shelter and then went back out at night and may have moved on within a day or two to either another cave or to their home cave. Um, the other thing that we don't most people don't think of is the the small tiny um, biology that occurs and that's the microbes. And in this case in this picture on the lower right hand side or what we call pool fingers. And there's a microbial der origination from these that for whatever reason, they have calcified, the water has deposited calcium on the outside of them and hit them. Um, this was uh, something that was not well understood until about 20 years ago. And um, that's one of the m amazing things about this region is that this because of the different types of caves, the different type of biology found within these caves, the different elevations of these caves, we keep discovering new things geologically, hydrologically, and biologically. And, and there aren't that many cave regions that can say they've had such a significant impact on um, our knowledge or the science of speleology. And the last slide is pretty cool. So as you can see, we're up on top of the ridge. This was taken from Carlsbad Caverns um, and the bats are coming out of the cave. But what they will do as they zigzag across the landscape is they will end out on the flats there where there's agricultural lands and they will be eating the bugs and stuff. Sometimes the bats have been known to fly as far as 40 and 50 miles in one night. And then they come back at dawn they may not come back in mass. Sometimes it's only a few of them at once. And then they'll drop back into the cave. 
And so this is another sign of, you know, the, the amazing things about our caves in the area. Um, the bats were one reason why Carlsbad came to um, the world's attention, even though the cave had been known about by the local Native Americans. Um, it was this type of flight that attracted a cowboy and his partner out to look to figure out what this was about. And um, from from there, it was amazing the history that has happened in, in terms of protecting caves and the wildlife. The, the interesting thing is that most caves out on the flatlands are not well known. Even today, a lot of people do not understand that out in the Permian Basin there, that there are caves. Uh, so this that's one of the, for better or worse, one of the better kept secrets about the caving community in, in the Carlsbad region. Um, but we hope that um, you all develop a really good understanding of the types of caves, the variety of caves, and we'll help support them whether you want to go caving or not. Amazing. Thank you so much, Pat. Um, and again, we'll have some time uh, after the next small portion for Q&A. So be thinking of your questions if you have some, and you can enter those into the chat and we'll see them. We're going to move now to uh, Dave's short film. Um, I'm just going to toggle my audio settings. Welcome to Southeast New Mexico, very near Carlsbad Caverns, a seemingly desolate landscape, an area most would consider wasteland. In reality, it's an area teeming with wildlife. Rare, endangered plant life, Native American archaeological sites, and caves. There is a hidden world under our feet, an oasis for the desert dwellers that call it home. Here in the high desert northeast in Eddy County in Mexico, the land is pockmarked with caves. Like Swiss cheese, the passages twist and turn. Many have never been fully explored. Unlike the nearby famous Carlsbad Caverns, these caves see far less attention and therefore less protection. Many cave researchers are trying to change that, but in the meantime, Keeping rapidly developing infrastructure from collapsing into caves and local industry workers safe has become a priority, while work is being done in the background to protect these caves long term. Today we are following members of a geophysical consulting company, speleologists is the term used for cave researchers, as they explore and map a cave very close to active oil operations. They worry that further progress might impact the cave but to have a better understanding of the cave, they must fully explore and map it. A sump is where the cave passage is filled with water, forming a lake, and further exploration is halted unless the lake is dived. Karst is an area characterized by its many sinkholes, fissures, underground streams, and caves. Karst topography generally occurs in areas of carbonate and evaporite-rich bedrock, such as limestone or gypsum. These types of rock are easily dissolved and form caves readily. Groundwater can easily be contaminated in karst areas. Already, many caves in the area are being impacted. Many caves get drilled or trenched into, which is very dangerous for the equipment operators above if the cave collapses under them. Cases of such have already been documented in the area. It's important for the workers' safety, as well as the environment, that we only put new infrastructure in the correct locations, avoiding caves and karst. Thankfully today, we have the knowledge and technology to check these areas before they are built on. We have trained karst surveyors who can survey these areas. We have resources such as resistivity studies and ground penetrating radar that can tell us more about the subsurface, including if there are cave-like voids. On some public land, this is already a legal requirement of the land manager but there are still large gaps to be filled in karst awareness. 
We owe it to ourselves and future generations to protect these aquifers and other sensitive resources. We owe it to the owls, mice, and bats that call these places home. With an impending shortage of fresh water in humanity's future, we cannot risk contaminating our groundwater through mismanagement of these resources. Right. Well, thank you both so much. Um, apologies for the video pause. I wanted to make sure if there wasn't an audio issue. Um, so we'll go ahead and move into our Q and A. Um, and I see a question that popped up in uh, the Q and A panel um, from Karen. Do you have anything similar to Snowy River uh, down here? And I imagine she's referring to in the Carlsbad region, um, but I'll hand that over to <laughs> the experts. So Snowy River is part of the um, Fort Stanton, which is in pretty much the center of New Mexico, Capitan. Um, and Carlsbad region has nothing like Snowy River. Um, we have other extraordinary formations, but nothing like Snowy River. It has, we have yet to find anything similar to that. Um, a few questions to kick us off um, that we've got. Um, can you uh, either or both speak to some of the interconnectedness of the landscape and in particular the Lechuguia cave system, which is still being discovered and explored? So um, I got lucky. I started exploring in, in Lechuguia when it was about a mile and a half long. And then finally uh, was retired from going there when it was a little over 125 miles long, I think. Um, it is, it's the one that started making people really question what we, how we understood the landscape, the, how all these different um, ways caves were formed. It validated the um, hydro, hydrogen sulfide theory about how the caves were formed because things had not been moved. They hadn't been changed as trails were developed um, in Carlsbad itself. Um, we'd love to think that this cave will connect with Carlsbad um, and another cave that's on the property there, Spider Cave. Uh, in some ways that would be awesome because that would mean another century of, of exploration and many generations working on that. Um, but we just don't know. And um, how how like big or long do you um, estimate or kind of see um, Lechuguia, the network, maybe? So um, there were some wind studies done back when Lechuguia was first being explored. Um, and the number that was put out there was there's probably 700 miles of passage. However, the scientist was very quick in clarifying that 700 miles of passage for the winds to move through doesn't mean humans necessarily can get through. And maybe some of those little critters. <laughs> right. Thank you, that's awesome. Um, another one from the Q&A. Um, Let's see, I think the first one, another from Karen, this is the same type of geology that's just east of Roswell, correct, i.e. Bitter Lakes and Bottomless Lakes. Yeah, so uh, out to the east of the Carlsbad area, uh, that geology is similar, um, but there is uh, there are some differences. The bedrock that's out east of, Arte or, excuse me, east of Artesia and Roswell is just a little bit different than the bedrock that's in uh, the areas to the east of Carlsbad. Um, you still get a lot of gypsum, but you also have some limestones and dolomites. Uh, the cave formations, uh, there's quite a bit of cave formations occurring in both areas that are what we call hypogene, which is from the type of caves that form from the bottom up. Um, and the karst formations that you see out 
east of uh, Roswell and east of Artesia are, uh, are, are Artesian formations where the water is actually coming down slope from the mountains to the west and then coming back up at the river. Uh, and as it's doing so, it's dissolving, dissolving the caves out. Oh, thanks, Dave. Um, another question. Um, can you talk about um, potential impacts of human activities and development on the aquifers in this region? Yeah, and that's one of the things that we do most of our work in. Uh, we do quite a bit of work in Eddy County, all around uh, Carlsbad, South Carlsbad, East Carlsbad, Northwest. Um, a lot of it is uh, very near the park as well. And what we're seeing is that a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of development is in areas that are impacting caves. Um, quite frequently, we see areas where um, somebody has tried to put in a pipeline, and so they're trenching through a particular area, um, and they actually unroof a cave. Um, this has happened three times just in the past few months, where we've gone out and had to evaluate uh, a cave that has been trenched into from a pipeline being built. Um, we also see frequently um, areas that are impacted from uh, releases or spills uh, from produced water, from oil, um, packing water. I mean, just, just about anything you can imagine uh, where the, the fracking ponds, for example, I'll just use this as one example, uh, are put into an area where they shouldn't, they don't have any business being there. And we've on several occasions just seen the entire pond disappear down um, some of these caves that are underneath uh, the, the, where they put the pond and they didn't, you know, they didn't know they were there because they didn't do their due diligence. This is something that's changing, um, both the Bureau of Land Management and the New Mexico State Land Office and now even the Oil Conservation Division uh, is finally understanding a little bit more about what karst is and how it impacts uh, or how it can be impacted by industry. And a lot of new regulations are being put in place at this point um, the regulations that were spearheaded essentially by the BLM and that now the New Mexico State Land Office and OCD are also taking on board and starting to enforce, which I'm very happy to see. I mean, not the least of which because that's what I do for a living. I actually love to be put out of business because I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, but that's not, not the case, not yet anyway. Thank you, Dave. Um, Pat, anything to add on impacts to the aquifers? Uh, they can be quite serious. Um, oil and gas produce water when they bring up the oil and the, and the gas, um, and that has to be put back down into the land. Um, and if they're, you know, there's there's permitting processes that are there to help make sure that the produced water goes back into similar formations. Um, but that produced water is filled with various chemicals and stuff from the petroleum products and stuff. And if it... Um, isn't properly put back in, there can be a huge impact on, on the rest of the waters. Um, there, even the ranchers need to be aware of what's going on. People who drive their cars out to, to sinkhole and dump their trash and stuff in are not really fully understanding that that garbage um, is going to go when it, as it starts dissolving and stuff goes into the water aquifers. So we need to be very, very aware of what we do with our own waste. Thank you. Um, there's a question from uh, Shiana. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, how long do you think before some of these caves collapse? So I can answer that one as well because we see this happen uh, almost weekly, actually. Um, the, for example, the cave in, in the background uh, of my um, image here, that's called Skylight Cave. The, the cave itself, it's been there for quite a long time. Uh, it's been known about for a very long time. It's actually quite a large cave for this area, at least the room is that collapsed to the surface. Um, but just a, a couple of months ago, uh, part of this particular cave collapsed and closed off some uh, passage that's lower down. So that's just one example. Another example is in an area um, maybe five miles to the to the east of this location. Um, there is an area that 
where there were uh, there was no cave uh, in 2019, and we looked at imagery from 2021, and all of a sudden there's this enormous sinkhole there full of water. In fact, the one of the images from the video that I showed you was of that sinkhole. Um, it was the one with the kind of a pretty blue water in it. Um, so we actually decided to dive that just to see where it went and how deep it was. And it turns out that that particular passage went down about 60 feet, um, which we found quite interesting. So that cave, you know, had been forming at, you know, for however long, and it finally breached the surface. It was not there one minute, and then access to it was there. It probably didn't take maybe a few minutes for the whole thing to collapse. And the interesting part to me was that it was uh, there was a, a two-track dirt road going right over the top of it, which is now no longer there in that location. So bottom line is, to answer your question, these caves collapse frequently and regularly. Um. Could either or both of you talk a little bit about some of the, we've talked, you know, touched on this the last few questions, but uh, the really biggest risks to the landscape and including um, the uh, above ground uh, flora, fauna, in, as well as the subterranean resources. Well, I'll talk a little bit from my perspective and then Dave can do it from his perspective. So there's um, an incredible amount of, things that we don't think about you know we see a, cr a critter we see it in the cave you know we're out on the landscape but some of the stuff that we don't think about is um, night skies you know they're beautiful to see the stars but the lights and stuff that we put out there also impact the wildlife um, some animals move away from the lights some animals depending on the t uh, color variation of the lights benefit um some of the more sulfury yellow lights attract bugs and then which then get it you know attract the bats and stuff um that you know great for the bats not so great for the insects that are going to the lights for other reasons um so we we think of night skies often just like i said just for the stars but there are other issues to be concerned about um noise carries across that landscape um, there's there's no buffers. There's no trees. There's no big hills. There's no buffers. Um, you drop as you drive out through there. You may drop down into a short um, canyon-like area, and it's you don't realize how much noise there is that we put out in the landscape until you get out of the car. You're hanging around, looking at everything, looking at holes in the ground, <laughs> see where they go. Get back in the car and drive back up onto the to the main portion of the land and suddenly all the noise starts hitting you. Um, and it's, for some people, it's part of what they live with every day and they just don't realize how unusual that is. Uh, so, um, you know, it's just, and, and, you know, one of the other things um, I, I mentioned in our conversations earlier was there's a lot we don't know. Um, Lechagia Cave may change my life in the sense that it may save my life. The microbes that they've discovered there, one of the first microbes they tested on leukemia cancers, killed off all the leukemia cells. They're testing it and have been testing it on other ones. Um, I'm not sure where things stand today, but I do know that breast cancer runs in my family. And it would be um, fascinating to find out that some microbe that was discovered in the cave that I helped explore saves my life in the future. Yeah, so as far as animals and, uh, and critters go in caves in, in the areas that we work in, um, as you saw in the video, there's there's all sorts of animals that are using these caves for shelter. Uh, coyotes, fox, uh, rattlesnakes, uh, bull snakes, um, the owls, um, all sorts of microbes that were out there. And it's it's interesting to me because I've been working in this area for um, well probably almost 13 years now and when I first started working out there when there when a lot of the infrastructure wasn't actually in place yet there were it was you know there's a lot of wildlife we saw we saw snakes everywhere we saw rabbits everywhere we saw 
um, coyotes, you know, frequently. Uh, we saw the, uh, the mule deer and the antelope. Um, and a lot of these are still out there. So we, we do still see the mule deer out there. We still see the antelopes out there quite a bit. But the things that we don't see are the, the, the predator animals. We don't see the snakes anymore. Um, we, we actually went several years without seeing a rattlesnake, and we finally this year started seeing a couple rattlesnakes again. Um, we don't see the coyotes as much as we used to anymore. We don't see, uh, we don't, we don't see the, the rabbits either, so that makes sense that we're not seeing the coyotes. The rabbits are not there, so the coyotes have gone elsewhere. Um, and the rabbits, I would assume, are going elsewhere because of the noise, because of the light. So uh, they are being impacted. Um, I don't... No, I'm, you know, I don't know how the lights actually affect them. So whether or not there's a way to, to make it better for them, uh, I hope there is, but I don't know. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, thank you both. Uh, great. A couple of questions from Anthony. Um, uh, the first, is there any current research on the cave systems and the results of Project Gnome nuclear testing? It's actually an interesting question. I don't know if there's any research that specifically targets Project Gnome. Um, I do know that we, my company, is researching uh, the impacts of the salt mines, the, the potash mines that are out there, and how they are uh, affecting cave formation in the area. For example, um, in the where, area where we do a lot of our work there at Burton Flats, um, one of the potash mines out there has recently resumed um, mining or doing solution mining out there and the area has actually started to subside again and so this subsidence creates what we call ring fracture zones and these ring fractures create openings or pathways from the surface down into the subsurface where fresh water can then uh, make its way in and start to dissolve these out so what they call solution enlarged fractures and these at some point will enlarge into caves and so we know that that's occurring um, the rate at which it's occurring, we're not sure yet. That's one of the things that we're studying. Uh, we have been able to use this information that we've learned to reroute several major pipelines going through the area so that they're not actually going over the area that's subsiding, which of course could cause issues in, in the future. Um, and, and I'm actually finding it very uh, easy to convince the oil companies to go around these areas because they don't they don't want their pipelines broken any more than we do. So. Um, another from Anthony, is anyone testing for PFAS or forever chemicals in cave system waters? I suspect it's being done, um, but I don't know who specifically is, is doing it. We, we're checking the cave waters for a, a variety of chemicals. And um, we will have a quick uh, note after Q&A about some uh, other work around PFAS, uh, Anthony. So thank you for that question. Um, Paul asked, does this geology and do these problems extend into Texas? Um, and asking about Texas uh, regulations and what they're doing to create those. Uh, yes, definitely. The geology and the caves that are associated with them do extend down into Texas, but you know they don't stop at a, at a man-made border. Um, unfortunately, some of these regulations do. So I don't really know that Texas is implementing any regulations or rules that require car surveys or uh, recommendations for uh, petroleum companies to take that into account when they're doing, uh, you know, doing their planning or doing their permitting. Um, what I do know that several of the companies that I work with have actually been coming to me and asking me to do these surveys anyway, because they know that it can, it's not, you know, some of them are somewhat worried about the environment, but more, they're more worried, of course, about safety issues, losing equipment, uh, having their infrastructure damaged. And so those are the reasons that they're coming to us. I don't care why they're coming. I'm just happy that they're coming because it allows me to, uh, it gives me the opportunity to try to protect these caves. Um, I wonder if just out of kind of the incredible nature of the landscape, um, could one of you talk about the just extension to the Guadalupe Mountains? Because that's another nearby national park. 
and has some really interesting visible, but then also, yeah, kind of subtle connections to the caverns in this whole landscape. Well, these um, have the similar, they're all limestone. Um, they have similar origins from the bottom up uh, and they are fabulous. They are considered world-class caves. Um, we've uh, gotten to know people from around the world who have come to do photography, to do caving, to do research. Uh, microbial research is a big thing, wind associated uh, research, hydrology, just the geology of the individual caves. Um, so yes, there is a direct link between these um, caves in, in the Guadalupe, in the Lincoln National Forest and within Carlsbad area. Yeah, huge connection across a massive landscape. It's awesome. Um, and then uh, Krista had a question for Kaylee. Um, uh, CCSFF is a citizen-based group advocating for health issues uh, caused by the industry. Do they also specifically message for the protection of the geological resources, even in connection with them providing necessary habitat or is standalone? Um, yeah, so we work on, you know, many different issues as it's really a checkerboard when it comes to protecting our area from, you know, the impacts of oil and gas production. And so, yes, this is a world we're slowly starting to wade into is um, how can we protect this precious, um, you know, yeah. this precious ecosystem right under our feet here in Southeast New Mexico and Carlsbad. Thanks, Kaylin. Great, and I think just one last question um, that's kind of a fun one. Um, so the Cave and Karst Institute is based in Carlsbad, but they go all over the world. Um, can you talk about where else across the globe these karst systems occur in uh, similar ways? The entire world has karst. Every, almost every country there is has karst or caves. Um, not all caves are found in karst. They can be found in glaciers. There was a recent announcement about a large void found in the Antarctic, which has an underground river. Uh, so there's a cave there. Um, and there are uh, more and more caves that are being looked at throughout Europe um, that have similar origins to the bottom up development of the caves. Um, Caves are, the original cave research started in um, Europe. Kars, Karst is on, um, based in a, from a community, Slovenia, is that correct, Dave? Uh, Slovenia or Slovakia, one of the two. Okay, sorry to anyone from those countries, <laughs> don't mean to slight you. Um, but because they had a classic, the, the whole landscape flooded and then it would drain, and then it would flood in the spring again and drain. And it changed, it formed how that that particular area, how people use the landscape, they were prepared for flooding and draining. They knew where to build their homes, they knew where to do their crops, how to how to set up crop rotation, when to when to harvest, when not to go out on the landscape. Um, and so the the start of speleology, the the exploration, the understanding, the science of caves and cars and the landscape began in Europe. So yeah, China, Japan, Australia, the world is just filled with caves and karst. Yeah, uh, and I did see we got one last question um, about if the budget of Carlsbad um, Caverns National Park is being threatened with reductions. Um, right now, the entire park NPS uh, is uh, looking at really, really drastic cuts to funding, which are would be incredibly harmful to park operations across the country. Um, and so that can come in the form of just staffing, uh, just different things that are, you know, our parks really need to be able to offer visitor services and resource protection. So thank you for that question. Absolutely um, an issue. And I just wanna thank uh, Pat and Dave for being here. So fantastic to have you share your expertise. Um, we'll move on to our next uh, closing session, but I'll go ahead and, um, and have you guys
Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so much. Just real quick, it is Slovenia. I just looked it up. Slovenia. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both for your incredible work. That's so crucial. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. All righty, folks. So, oh, sorry, Emily, I'll let you go to the next slide. I just oh, that's okay. Yep, Kaylee, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah. Um. So Dave's video mentioned that the groundwater and the aquifers in these cave and karst rich landscapes are um at a particular are particularly vulnerable to contamination, and um recently the organization Physicians for Social Responsibility back in April. They came out with a report um, documenting the use of PFAS, so forever chemicals, in oil and gas operations. So particularly in the fluid that they use to frack with. And um, so just a little overview of those findings. Between 2013 and 2022, oil and gas companies injected at least 261 New Mexico wells with 9,000 pounds of PFAS for use in fracking. And then over that same period, oil and gas firms injected more than 8,200 wells with 243 million pounds of trade secret fracking chemicals that could be PFAS or other dangerous substances. Um, so, you know, not only are our aquifers particularly vulnerable, but also we have these very bad chemicals that are just um, constantly being injected into the ground in this region. And because of that, um, Wild Earth Guardians, along with a lot of other organizations, um, National Parks Conservation Association, Citizens Caring for the Future, we petitioned the Oil Conservation Division Commission here in New Mexico to adopt a rulemaking. And this rulemaking will do a few things. So um, it will remove trade secret exemptions because right now um, the oil and gas industry has these trade secret exemptions, which is why we have 243 million pounds of chemicals that we're not exactly sure what they are. Um, it'll require prior disclosure of all downhole, downhole chemicals. It will require community notification. And lastly, it will prohibit the use of PFAS chemicals in oil and gas production. And so they granted the petition to have that rulemaking. Um, there will be a hearing a rulemaking hearing February 26th through March 1st, and that'll be hybrid. So there'll be opportunity to give public comment in support of this rulemaking. And um, we can keep folks up to date on how that is going, ways you can help out um, through our respective list. If you don't happen to be on Citizens Caring for the Futures list or National Parks Conservation Association email list, um, please let us know in the chat and we will get you added. And then right now I'm dropping in the chat as well, um, a link that will take you to a landing page that talks a little bit more about this oil and gas rulemaking, has a petition that you can sign um, to urge the governor to support this rulemaking. And yeah, that's just a little bit, um, one of the many ways that we can protect these caves and um, the aquifers here in the Carlsbad region. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Yeah, thanks for, you know, an action that you can take today and something that incredible groups uh, on the ground and across the state are working on um, to solve some of these problems. Um, and um, we'll be sure, as Kaylee said, to loop you into future uh, actions and opportunities to protect this amazing landscape. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Our emails are here on this screen. Um, and we will be working through land management planning processes and other routes to assess and really just try to find ways to take these lands off the table for oil and gas development, for the protection of public health, the environment, um, and wildlife. Uh, so don't hesitate to reach out anytime. We have upcoming opportunities uh, to get involved, including uh, on lease sales, oil and gas uh, processes um, from the BLM and from other agencies. And we have tools that you can use to craft your own messages for advocacy, such as uh, letters to the editor or outreach to decision makers to, about what you've learned today. And then I just, I raised my hand. Um, Karen had said that the chat wasn't working. I think I fixed it and opened it up to where everyone can type in the chat. So if you were trying to get your email address in there to be added to a list, um, it should be open for you to do that now. Thanks, Kaylee. Perfect. 
Um, and Karen, if you do type it in, it might be visible to us, but not um, to the, the attendees. So maybe try it one more time. Okay. Um, Karen, I'll go ahead and follow up with you afterwards. I think um, we can find out a way to get you plugged in. All right, well, that's all we have for you today. Um, we do have three minutes left if anyone has any very last questions. But again, please send us an email um, if you'd like to talk more, be involved um, with this really important issue. Uh, we're working hard on it and we'd love to work together with you. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending.